to balance these considerations, which are that over 300 bills, the vast majority by Republicans. Sorry, was that too loud? Oh, no. So I just, just sounded like somebody dropped a silverware drawer. Yeah, yeah. Robbie broke something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. Last Thursday, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed a package of voting rule changes into law. The law contains a number of controversial provisions, like giving more authority over the state elections board to the legislature instead of the Secretary of State. And it also bans volunteers from giving food, water, or chairs to people waiting to vote. The law also expands early voting times after an earlier proposal would have limited voting on weekends. And it requires a form of ID for casting an absentee ballot, but does not eliminate absentee or mail voting for Georgians under 65, as was previously considered. We're going to discuss the new law and put it in context of the other proposals from Republicans around the country that could make voting more difficult. We're also going to take a look at the challenges facing the Biden administration when it comes to dealing with the surge of migrants at the southern border and immigration reform more broadly. There does not appear to be a broad consensus among Democrats about how to address the issue. And in the near term, the U.S. is seeing the largest increase in migrants at the southern border in 20 years, according to the Homeland Security Secretary. Here with me to discuss it all, our editor-in-chief, Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, Galen. Also here with us is politics editor Sarah Frostenson. Hello, Sarah. Hey, Galen. And elections analyst Nathaniel Rakich. Hello, Nathaniel. Hey, Galen. Before we get into any of the topics that I just mentioned, I want to ask one of our favorite questions, which of course is good use of polling or bad use of polling. Today's example is a little more complex. It's maybe best use of polling. Uh, So we're going to talk about DC statehood polling. A number of recent polls have gotten significantly different results when asking Americans whether or not they support DC becoming a state. So nonpartisan polls that have simply asked, do you support or oppose granting statehood, have found that Americans are pretty evenly divided. So in two recent polls, for example, 49% of Americans supported DC statehood and 45% opposed. In another poll, it was 35% support, 41% opposed. But those are nonpartisan polls. So when you look at the Democratic Aligned Data for Progress poll, they told respondents that D.C. statehood would give Washingtonians representation like every other state, and support rose to 54%. When they said that it would fix a taxation without representation problem, support rose even further to 58%. Likewise, when Republican-aligned pollster Rasmussen Reports told respondents that the U.S. Constitution designates the nation's capital as a federal district and not a state, support fell to 29%, with 55% opposing. So, nonpartisan polls, you get pretty closely divided country, but with different framing based on the partisanship of the pollster, you get some significantly different responses. So, the question this time around, Nate, kick us off, is which of these is the best use of polling? I mean, I don't really care for polls that like give you like some spin, right? I don't really understand why those are interesting. So I only care about these nonpartisan polls or just, and it's also like DC statehood, it's like not this incredibly complex thing, right? It's like not like the public option or something where you have to like explain it to people. Like should Washington DC become a state? I understand what that means. I think every American understands what that means. You'd have 51 states. You have to add a star to the flag or maybe two if you had Puerto Rico too. So yeah, so I look at those nonpartisan polls and they show roughly speaking that it's um, evenly divided country on this issue. I think I would call all of these good uses of polling in their own way. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I agree with Nate that the that the issue is... I mean, maybe it's straightforward, but I don't think it's an issue that Americans have spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, So I think that, you know, I think that is shown, frankly, in how the support changes so much, depending on how you frame the question. Um, And so I do think it's useful from a campaign or a partisan perspective to show the each side how they should be framing their side of the debate. I think campaigns do this all the time. You know, there's a, um, a tendency to decry, quote unquote, push polls, which actually um, aren't what people say they are push polls are actually just like straight up like um like 
bad things that people do. They're not even polls at all. Um, but the the kind of messaging polls that campaigns put out there that are saying, you know, would you support a candidate who says X, Y, or Z or supports X, Y, Z policy? That's an important part, I think, of politicians calibrating their messages to make sure that they are accurately representing the will of the people. And so I think on an issue that's just kind of starting to come out onto the national stage, I think it's totally fair for each side to kind of figure out what uh, you know what makes the public f- come on their side on this issue and what doesn't. Where I think the issue where it becomes a bad use of polling is if a partisan actor uses, say, the Data for Progress poll, doesn't mention the fact that the question is obviously putting a thumb on the scale and says, oh, look, 58% of Americans support D.C. statehood. Obviously, that's disingenuous. What is a push poll? It is basically when a campaign calls up thousands and thousands of people, like Robo calls them basically, and says, you know, would you vote for Joe Biden, the, you know, like devil worshiping, like uh, terrible Democrat? Or would you vote for Nikki Haley, the, you know, like inspiring story, South Carolina governor? Um, And it pretends to be a poll, basically. But what really they're doing is disseminating this messaging to thousands and thousands of people and not even necessarily collecting the data. Um, so basically, it, it functions as a, a robocall that, or a call that tells mes- voters, hey, Joe Biden is evil and Nikki Haley is good. OK, Sarah, we got a split decision so far. That's true. I think I am closer on this to where Nathaniel is in terms of it is useful to understand in this debate, how you frame it matters. It does shift opinions. Um, That said, of course, like the fact that it isn't a simple yes, no, you can't then trace it historically. Like one thing you can do, you know, with the other polls is kind of see that there has been a slight shift in support for DC statehood since it kind of re-emerged on the national scene last summer. Again, not a huge shift, but enough of one that um, it is closer now to a majority in in some polls. But it makes comparison difficult, right? And I do think what Nathaniel mentioned about bad actors and disingenuously framing it often happens as a result of these polls, which then can kind of question some of their validity and worth. In the real world, one side doesn't get to dictate how things are framed, right? Um, And so one hypothetical branch of a message that we would like to frame things as, right? It, it doesn't really have any applicability to <laughs> to the real world, you know? Um, we unpack that further, Nate, because they're saying like, okay, well, this is basically telling partisans, if you want to sell this issue to the American public, you should say, we need DC statehood because taxation without representation is un-American. And Rasmussen is saying, okay, if you're a Republican who wants to prevent this, you should say, Let's follow the U.S. Constitution the way it was written. D.C. is not meant to be a state. It's meant to be a district. Like, isn't that useful information? I mean, first of all, there's like probably some cherry picking and kind of which top lines these groups tend to put out, right? That's kind of part of my concern. If you test a bunch of messages, then maybe by chance alone, some of them work better than others, right? But no, I mean, it's like, you know, again, you don't control kind of how the message will be heard by people some things and also messages are rebutted right you might have a uh initial feeling I and mean, this is like the famous possibly apocryphal like coke kind of pepsi test thing right where like people like pepsi better if they have a little bit because it's sweeter but then it doesn't age as well right so if you have like a longer term gestation period so you can make an argument that if it's unrebutted it might seem really smart but the minute that people kind of get in there and let me give you a good example for example right a lot of the left in the primaries last year. Was it last year or two years ago? My God, last year, right? Although in the premise of the primaries leading up in 2019, um, there was this debate about kind of Medicare for all. Um, and Medicare for all is a really kind of cleverly constructed buzzword because Medicare is a popular program for all who could object to that. And so kind of when you use the term Medicare for all, it's initially very popular until people start defining what that means, right? And if it means eliminating private health insurance, then it's not that popular a program. And so like kind of, you know, you don't get to have one message in a vacuum that isn't being manipulated and (laughs) mitigated and ameliorated by like all types of, I'm just using lots of long M words, some which aren't even even applicable there. Um, But like, it's like, it's an artificial exercise, I think. Mm -hmm. It's like the, you know, Coke Pepsi test. (laughs) 
I think the difference is that I mean Nate might be and Nate's absolutely right that you know that both sides will will make their arguments and that might cancel each other out and Nate kind of because of his position as someone who's really interested in public opinion is interested in what the American people really think but I do think that if you know if you put yourself in a partisan's shoes it, the, the polls are useful and I am actually curious to see you know for example if these are the two main arguments made by Democrats and Republicans we're also assuming that those arguments are viewed as equally valid um um, and so none of these polls really pit the two arguments against each other. Maybe one of them will end up being much more persuasive to the American people. OK, so who do you think wins out here? Do you think it just ends up like a 50-50 draw? How does this what do we learn about the future from this polling? That's a good question. Um, you know, unless the the it girl of 2021, the filibuster um, is done away with, I don't see this going in front of Congress anytime soon. So I do think, particularly given that, you know, the nonpartisan polls here do show that Americans are pretty divided on this. Eleanor Norton Holmes, for instance, too, has said that she thinks, you know, Congress should take their time before they take it up. And obviously for her, that would be a big deal because she would finally have representation in the House in terms of being able to vote on bills. That's the that's the non-voting representative from D.C. Correct. And so, you know, some of the Democrats, too, including Manchin, Cinema, and the likely suspects there have been quiet on whether or not they support D.C. statehood. So as popular as this is in terms of a debate, um, it's hard for me to see it actually being taken up anytime soon. Does everyone agree? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's one of the more obvious things that Democrats can do um, to help one might say level the playing field because currently the Senate really advantages Republicans given the way that Republicans overperform in these lower population rural states right now. I don't know. Maybe Democrats say, screw it. It's kind of a binary outcome, right? If you're, if you're passing some of the HR1 stuff, which is this big anti-gerrymandering voting rights, big kind of complicated package, right? If you're doing that, which is not done without eliminating the filibuster, then why not add states? Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. The caveat there, though, Nate, would be states are often introduced in pairs. And the second pair here would be Puerto Rico, which also leans Democratic. And I think it's going to be hard for Republicans to side with this issue and not something that could be passed through budget reconciliation. So, again, I just I don't think it'll happen. Well, so I'm saying you have to nuke, you'd have to nuke the filibuster. But like adding one blue state and one, let's call it indigo, somewhere between blue and purple, indigo, probably state. Okay. That's something I think parties that are smart, they do. They do find ways. I mean, Republicans do it, right? You know, when they have power, they find ways to, like, tip the scales in a way that they're more likely to keep that power. And they're kind of unforgiving about it, Republicans are, right? Um, and Democrats seem very squeamish about it. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I would note that. You know, I wouldn't conflate the issues of Puerto Rico and D.C. statehood because Puerto Rico actually does have some Republicans in support of statehood, and it's less clear what its partisanship would be. Um, but in terms of just D.C. statehood, if I had to guess public opinion wise where um, pol public opinion will end up, I would say it's going to end up polarized along party lines like pretty much every other issue. All right. And with that. Let's move on and talk about the new voting laws in Georgia and other Republican proposals. As I mentioned at the top, on Thursday, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed a 98-page package of voting rule changes into law. These changes come after Democrats won both the presidential and Senate races in the state, and Trump falsely claimed that there was widespread voting fraud. I want to talk about the specifics of these new changes, and then I also want to talk about the bills that we're seeing in other states. So Nathaniel, along with our colleagues Alex and Elena, published a piece on the site today tracking the different proposed voting restrictions from Republicans around the country. Let's begin with Georgia. We've talked about various proposed changes to voting law in Georgia, primarily limiting weekend voting um, and Sunday voting in particular that could limit souls to the polls. And then we also talked about the proposal to eliminate absentee or mail voting for Georgians under the age of 65. To clarify here, neither of those proposals actually made it into this final law. So those were some of the most controversial proposals. They aren't in here. But Nathaniel, uh, I want to hear from you, w what exactly did make it into this 98-page kind of final bill that was signed into law last week? 
So as you mentioned, Galen, the bill is extremely long, and so there are lots of different provisions that we don't have time to go through. But some of the ones that are getting the biggest attention are requiring proof of identity, such as um, a photocopy of your ID or the um, your driver's license number in order to cast an absentee ballot, just like voters in Georgia and in many other states uh, are required to show ID if they vote in person, mirroring that process. Um, the Bill also standardizes early voting hours, um, but it does, as you mentioned, it still allows counties to provide Sunday early voting if they want to. Um, it also restructures the state board of elections so that the secretary of state, who, of course, many Republicans are not a fan of these days, is no longer on the board. And instead, the legislature can appoint that member of the board. And also the state board of elections can remove local elections from their posts, which Democrats have said they fear will be targeting county election officials in places like Fulton County, um, which is where Atlanta is, um, kind of these majority minority areas um, and kind of basically taking local local control away from voters in those areas. Um, the bill also um, basically takes all the teeth out of drop boxes. So there can no longer be freestanding drop boxes. They have to be inside early voting locations and they're only accessible when those locations are open, which of course kind of defeats the purpose of the drop boxes. And then there are plenty of other provisions as well. Um, let's see, it gives voters less time to request absentee ballots. It prevents election officials from sending out uh, applications to vote by mail proactively, like dozens of states did during the 2020 election as well, um, and, and many, many other things as well. Oh, and of course, the, the, um, the provisions that you mentioned up top, the um, banning of giving voters uh, food and, and drink when waiting in line, that's been um, perhaps the most controversial element of the bill. So I think there are two big questions here. The first is, what is the effect of these changes on our elections? Does it prevent certain segments of the population? Or does it make it harder for certain segments of the population to vote, in particular black voters in Georgia? Um, that's, you know, that's one question. And then the other question is, regardless of the effect, what is the intent? Why are Republicans doing this after Democrats won those two Senate races? And of course, the, the presidential race in Georgia? Let's begin with the first one. Nate, what do we know about the effects of the of of the of these changes uh, that Nathaniel just mentioned? So this is somewhat debated in the literature. Um, you know, some research finds that there aren't terribly large partisan effects. It might lower turnout, but like doesn't necessarily advantage one side. My research actually suggests that there is a predictable partisan effect and that um, when you enact new voting laws, and not only does turnout go down, but it tends to advantage Republicans. You know, we might also talk about like revealed preference, right? Why are Republicans trying to do this? Well, it's not really about, they don't really care about voter integrity that much. They want to win more elections, right? And or make it harder for people who don't tend to like Republicans, like black people to vote. On the other hand, um, you have seen shifts in the kind of Trump era, or now the post-Trump era, where people who are higher socioeconomic status, people who are more educated, people in the suburbs tend to also be more, or have become more democratic now. Those people who like vote pretty regularly, people who may have more types of, I don't know what you call it, but like advantages or privileges where like they might not be facing necessarily the long line. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more unpredictable in a world where maybe the GOP is trying to, you know, make it harder for black people to vote, but might also make it harder for like certain like rural Trump supporters to vote. Nate's right that the evidence on this is mixed, but I think it's important not to lose sight of the normative stakes here, that one party is really leaning into the messaging of trying to restrict voting access. That makes me think of something we found in our survey last fall around people who are either non-voters or don't vote as frequently. A substantial chunk said that they don't feel like either party wants people like them to vote. 23% said that of Democrats and 31% said that of Republicans. So it is something that applies to both parties. You can't help but think with the recent uptick in numbers of laws we've seen passed this year, we counted over 300 so far, most of which have been sponsored by Republican legislatures, that that doesn't feed into voters' calculus, that, oh, this party doesn't want me to vote. And that's an important thing for the health of a democracy and a point that our colleague Perry Bacon made on Friday in his piece in terms of the bill in Georgia and its effects. I mean, we frankly have these debates <laughs> internally about kind of how important are the electoral consequences, right? Um, and I think they're very important. 
and yes, there are normative consequences as well, right? But like, um, I don't think Republicans would be doing this unless they thought there were also electoral consequences too. But it is tricky because like, you don't have this happening in a vacuum. You have democratic groups that are trying to raise the salience of this issue and make their voters more aware, right? It's one thing if you kind of pass a bunch of laws and nobody notices, and then four years later, something that a voter is used to, all of a sudden it's harder to do, right? That probably would reduce turnout. If that voter, however, is now hyper aware that, oh, Republicans are trying to make it hard for me to vote, right? Number one, them. And number two, I have to be more diligent now about making sure that I vote the right way, right? Then it, there's more risk of a backfire effect, potentially. And the fact that Republicans had to scrap some of these more unpopular provisions, I think, tells you that there are some degree of political constraints. Um, and for a long time, I think Democratic groups didn't focus enough on on voting rights, especially white Democratic groups, I think, didn't think about it as much as like black Democratic groups would. So, you know, so I, I guess I'm saying like, you can't take the politics <laughs> out of this issue, because only one side's trying to restrict voting rights, but both sides are trying to like weaponize this in a way that will help them in elections, right? And for Democrats, they weaponize it by saying, this is horrible, this is unacceptable. By the way, make sure that you understand whose side Republicans are on, not you if you're a black voter, and make sure that you know, you take extra care making sure that your vote is counted. Yeah, there there is some evidence that uh, laws like this can fire up the very population that they're meant to target. So, for example, in 2018, North Dakota uh, enacted a law that made it so that you had to have a um, permanent physical residential address in order to vote, which many Native Americans don't because they live on reservations. Um, and it actually ended up after a backlash saying that the law was targeting Native Americans, Native Americans actually ended up having um, very high turnout. Um, so, um, you know, there is definitely reason to think that maybe, you know, someone like Stacey Abrams will be able to convert this into votes in 2022. I actually think one of the things that's not being talked about enough, in particular with the Georgia bill, is Raff Raffensperger's role within it and how he's been reduced in terms of the power he has and oversight of the elections. Because there is so much uncertainty around well, how much will limiting absentee voting impact Democrats, impact Republicans. Remember, it wasn't really a partisan issue until 2020. That effort that Republicans have pushed through strikes me as one in which Republicans are laying the groundwork where it's easier to overturn election results, um, more so than trying to measure out how much difference one type of voting measure will make. And that, I think, is something to keep an eye on, in particular with the other bills being considered. Yeah, you saw bills introduced in legislatures like Pennsylvania and Arizona this year that didn't get anywhere, to be clear, but they effectively or literally would have uh, rescinded the certification of the electors and the legislature would have appointed their own. Yeah, I wanted to home in on what you just mentioned, Sarah, which is that actually the early proposals that did seem more directed at affecting turnout were done away with, right? So weekend voting and limiting mail or absentee ballot voting for those under the age of 65. The ID required for absentee voting now, you can put your driver's license, you can also put the last four of your social security numbers. So, you know, there is still pretty broad access here. And a lot of voting rights activists have talked about the challenges of signature verification because it is a pretty subjective process. This would do away with that. So when it comes to, you know, turnout, these are not like particularly draconian uh, changes that you would expect a lot of difference in turnout from. Now, the the water and food and chairs for people waiting in lines, I'm not really sure where that comes from. Um, but frankly, it seems like the bigger impact could be on the other side of the election during the counting process, during the certification process, and who has control over how all of that happens. Because as you mentioned, mentioned Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, has been in some ways neutered here. You know, what kind of concerns do we have about that process going forward, uh, given what we saw in 2020 and Trump's efforts to, particularly in Georgia, put pressure on elections officials there to overturn the result of the election? I think that kind of muddy relationship is what is the most cause of 
most cause for concern among Democrats right now. And that is elections were not overturned in 2020. The results were certified, but that also came at the expense of an insurrection at the Capitol and audio being released where the president did try to pressure Raffensperger to overturn the results. Um, Other reporting that he had tried to do the same with Governor Ducey in Arizona. And so what this does is it starts to give a blueprint where if the election results were in question again, the state legislators have more control now in that process to overturn the results. Now, does that mean that will happen? No, but it is removing barriers that prevented that from happening. And that, and not having that level of oversight, I think is some of the more troubling ways in which this law is over, is rewriting voting law in Georgia. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that for sure. Um, I would also say though, Galen, I'm not sure that the the turnout effects are that minimal. I I think we don't know. I mean, they could remove election officials before the election because they were coming up with creative ways to expand voting. Like, you know, in Texas, they were doing drive-through voting and 24-hour early voting, which were things I had never heard of happening before. So, you know, I think the idea is to, to remove election officials' discretion both before and after the election. Okay. So if officials in counties are, you know, making it easier to vote in ways that the legislature doesn't approve of, they can kind of uh, basically quash that before the election happens, while it's happening in the right. run-up to election. Or the, in this case, the, the legislatively appointed State Board of Elections, yeah. Um, all right. Well, definitely something to keep an eye on here. But as I mentioned, Nathaniel, you and our colleagues, Elena and Alex, published a, a big review of all of the different proposals that we've seen around the country this year from Republicans, uh, many of which could make it harder to vote. So can you kind of paint a broader picture of of what that looks like? How many different proposals are we seeing? What are the most uh, you know concerning from the perspective of making it harder to vote? And, and how many of them are likely to actually become law? Yeah, so um, we, uh, Alex, Elena, and myself uh, came out with this article where we mapped and kind of categorized over 300 bills that we have been tracking, um, many of which um, were from the Brennan Center's database, but we also added 50 of our own. Um, and the the results were staggering. So um, first of all, 89% of the bills were sponsored primarily or uh, entirely by Republicans. So that shows you that clearly the Republicans are the ones mostly behind these voter restrictions. Um, They've been introduced in almost every state across the country. Um, Almost half of them have to do with absentee voting, which I think uh, clearly is a kind of you can draw a straight line from Trump's fraud claims and the increase in absentee voting from the pandemic to that. That said, not all of these bills will become law. So we, of the 306 that we were tracking, only 53 were still alive and kind of progressing actively through the legislature. And of course, not even all of those will become law as well. You know, things like Democratic opposition or even intra-Republican opposition from um, from backlash, as we were talking about in Georgia with some of the more severe requirements. Um, you know, those kinds of things can still stop a bill. So I think it's important to 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 make a distinction here. So there are kind of like three points I want people to take away from the article. One is that Republicans in particular are introducing a really shocking number of voter restrictions. The the sheer kind of intent behind that and the existence of these efforts is important for normative reasons, as Sarah said. Secondly, though, a lot of these bills, most of them, and including the most severe ones, are not going to become law. So you know, it's not like there are going to be 300 new voter restrictions on the books next year. But then the third caveat, which is that it's not about the quantity of bills, it's about the quality of the bills. Um, And so even if only a handful of these laws pass, so so far we've tracked six laws that have passed and say only 10 end up becoming law by the end of 2021, those 10 bills can still contain quite a few voter restrictions, as we saw in Georgia, as we saw in Iowa, which is the other state that's really, um, really clamped down on Voting. Yeah, I know that Republicans are somewhat limited in where they can pass these laws because the battleground states in the upper Midwest in particular have uh, Democratic governors. And so the Republican legislature can't pass these laws on their own. You mentioned that we've seen six become law so far. So we've seen Georgia and Iowa, which has Republican, both of those states have Republican legislatures and governors. What other uh, states have we seen actual laws on the books so far this year? 
Yeah, so we've seen Utah make it easier to purge dead voters from the voter rolls. Uh, we've seen two bills in Arkansas to tighten that state's voter ID law. Um, specifically, it takes away the exception for people without an ID to sign an affidavit attesting to their identity. Um, and then a Kentucky law that um, takes away the ability of the governor and secretary of state to change election laws in an emergency, which, of course, um, Kentucky during the pandemic was held up as kind of a model of bipartisan cooperation when the Democratic governor and Republican Secretary of State reached an agreement to expand early and absentee voting. And you mentioned that a lot of these bills will not become law, but are there any states that you're watching in particular where you think that more restrictions are likely to come? Yeah, I think we're watching uh, pretty closely uh, a couple of bills in Texas uh, that have a bunch of new restrictions, including effectively banning drive through voting. Um, Florida is also another one where there's a bill that's a priority of Ron DeSantis's to ban drop boxes and, again, require ID in order to vote absentee. And then um, there are other states like Arizona um, that are also require, or looking to require uh, ID for absentee voting. Um, Missouri uh, is looking to tighten its voter ID law as well. Um, I would say, though, that um, Texas, Florida, Arizona, potentially Michigan, although, as you mentioned, there's a Democratic governor there. Those are the states that I think um, voting rights advocates are most concerned about. We talked a little bit about voters' reaction to this. I have a poll in particular. So you mentioned Iowa. Uh, in Iowa, the Republican legislature and then the Republican governor um, passed a bill into law that shortens the early voting period by nine days and then closes polls an hour earlier on Election Day. Seltzer and Company, which if you listen to our most recent podcast, you will know, uh, 530 has rated the best pollster in America. <clears throat> um, they did a poll in Iowa that showed 52% of voters opposed condensing the early voting period and 42% were in favor. And this is in a state that has trended pretty Republican over the past decade or so. So is this the kind of thing we should expect, you know, a broad based backlash against? You know, we talk about black voters in Georgia. Iowa is a more homogenous white state. 52% of voters are opposing this condensing early voting laws. Is this the kind of thing that becomes an electoral issue? Sarah or Nate, do you have thoughts on this? Historically, it hasn't been a high salience issue, right? I mean, that's why this notion of is it an electoral issue or not is kind of a chicken and the egg issue to some extent, because like it's an issue if people decide that it's an issue and the press frames it as like, hey, this is kind of what the GOP stands for. Clearly, Democrats both for reasons having to do with they want to, again, make sure their voters are aware that they have to um, be on alert for new voting restrictions and also because, like, you know, they want to kind of create some backlash to it potentially. But if the GOP says that we are concerned about election security, that's a concern that Americans might be somewhat sympathetic to, right? So, like, voter ID requirements, it seems to me like those tend to poll fairly well. Restrictions on like voting hours and stuff like that tend not to pull so well, right? Um, you're just making life kind of harder for people and giving them fewer options. And people usually don't voluntarily choose to give up options that they might have, right? So the GPS to be pretty careful in kind of what they're doing or what they're not because, you know, however big the effects are electorally, they're probably not enormous. They're probably on the margin to some extent. And so if you do something that has like a direct marginal effect that helps you, but indirect effect in terms of making you less popular, that hurts you. And especially if, again, remember, Trump actually gained a little bit of ground with non-white voters in 2020 relative to 2016, right? If this serves as a reminder to uh, voters of color that the GOP doesn't want you to vote, right, that makes it much harder for Republicans to kind of build any type of constituency with non-white voters as they would like to do, at least in theory, right? Um, so, you know, so that's also partly why, like, this thing in Georgia about like not being able to deliver food or water to people who are in line, like that seems like purely cruel and punitive. And it seems like that's something that like if you had the GOP being smart and tactical here, it's not something that you would do, right? Because it probably doesn't actually deter people from voting that much, but like it just kind of seems like you're being a bunch of assholes. And so the fact that that provision survived is kind of interesting to me. Yeah, I was surprised, Galen, in the poll that you cited that given, right, how red Iowa has shifted in recent years, that so many Iowans were opposed um, 
to these measures. I think that goes back to what Nate was saying about, right, if you reduce hours, that makes it harder for people. But I also think something to keep an eye on here is how much of a pivot we see to this being election security and framed as such when the reality was there wasn't mass scale election fraud in 2020 and how seductive of a message that is to voters versus the message that, you know, you're losing voting rights. And does that appeal to voters more in terms of an issue and something to vote against here in 2022? Right. And that's something that we've been tracking at 538, which is, you know, to what extent do Republican voters or independents believe, uh, former President Trump and other Republicans when they say that there was widespread voter fraud. That number seemed pretty high amongst Republicans, so we'll have to continue tracking it, like you mentioned. Um, Nathaniel, any closing thoughts here? Um, Yeah, I mean, just to build on to what Nate and Sarah were saying, I think that the public opinion on some of these voting access questions is actually not necessarily what you would expect. So, for example, before 2020, at least everyone, you know, liked absentee voting, Republicans included. Um, Voter ID laws are generally popular also, as Nate said. And I think it becomes a question of does this issue get framed more into get sucked into this kind of partisan like framing of they don't want you to vote versus we must protect the integrity of our elections. And then everybody starts to see all of these questions as just filters for the real question of like, do do you support the democratic view on voting rights or the Republican view on voting rights? So. All right. Well, as with all of this stuff, we will keep on tracking and Nathaniel, I know you've also been tracking some of the democratic from some of the bills proposed by Democrats as well that are trying to, you know, expand voting access. And we should talk about that sometime in the future. But let's move on and talk about why immigration and the current surge of migrants at the border is such a tricky topic for Democrats. Democrats are facing both short and long term political challenges when it comes to addressing immigration. In the short term, the U.S. is experiencing the largest surge in migrants at the southern border in 20 years. The cause is multifaceted and debated, but it comes after Biden undid numerous Trump-era policies, including a rule aimed at keeping asylum seekers in Mexico while they await their hearings. The Biden administration is still using a Trump-era rule aimed at stemming the spread of coronavirus to turn away all migrants except for unaccompanied minors, and they're now struggling to house those minors adequately. In the longer term, it is not clear that there is a consensus among Democrats on a broader immigration reform package. The Democratic caucus includes views ranging from those who've called for abolishing ICE, the Immigration Enforcement Agency, to those who want stricter enforcement, including E-Verify, which would require businesses to check the employment eligibility of their employees with government data. According to Politico, a House whip count showed Democrats don't currently have the votes to pass Biden's big reform package that would provide a pathway to citizenship for most immigrants in the country illegally. So let's start with the short term. How serious of a challenge for the Biden administration is this migrant surge at the border? Sarah. It's pretty serious. Um, I know that it is often framed as a right wing talking point that, you know, there are migrant caravans at the border. Uh, And there is a lot of reporting to underscore that some of what we're seeing now is seasonal or it's expected after the border has been, you know, kind of shut down for the last year because of the pandemic. But the reality is, as you said at the top here, that it's still the highest it's been in roughly 20 years. And that's a problem for the Biden administration, particularly as they expect the numbers to tick up even higher. Um, And as Biden even said in an interview earlier this month, he's telling migrants, you know, don't come. I think what's hard and is a continual issue for Democrats in this is that it's a little bit unexpected. It's hard to know when there will be surges, what is driving the surges, when the surges will stop. And our immigration system is really just at capacity for how to house a lot of the unaccompanied minors who are trying to cross the border too. And, you know, it's one thing to roll back Trump's policies, but then what do you substitute in place? And that's what Democrats have to grapple with now. Yeah. How, how Nathaniel and Nate, how are you thinking about how serious of a challenge this is for the Biden administration? I mean, look, we, since we talked about this in kind of the previous segment, how the media frames things, I mean, I think there is some degree of truth in the notion that, like, if the press treats this as a huge deal, then it carries more political salience and maybe more downside risk for 
for Democrats. I mean, you know, one thing that kind of jumps out to me, though, looking at some of these numbers is like the notion of like thermostatic public opinion, which is that opinion kind of tends to actually go in the opposite direction of whoever has power, whoever is president. Under Trump, Democratic opinion, both among elite Democrats and rank and file voters, shifted in a much more pro-immigration direction over the course of, of four years of Trump. When Biden enters office, and now all of a sudden kind of he would bear blame or credit, I suppose, for, for immigration policy on the border, then that might be a bit different, right? How much increased Democratic support for immigration was kind of an anti-Trump signal that no longer applies as much under Biden, right? Because the line under the Democrats kind of used for years was like, you know, we have to secure the border and then find maybe a pathway to citizenship for people who are already here, right? Securing the border part was always kind of part of, of, of the kind of core, you know, I don't know if you look at like the Democratic platform from like, oh, wait, with Obama, right? But that's kind of was always part of the message. And that started to become challenged a little bit more under Trump. And now kind of in some ways, Biden is kind of like returning to like, a, a you know, late 2000s, early 2010s kind of Democratic message on immigration. Except I would caution though, like the party itself has shifted. I mean, in 2016, Clinton's platform didn't even mention illegal immigration. Whereas to your point, right, no, wait, that was a really salient issue. But I think part of it too is that the party, the Democratic Party, is really divided on this question too, which ties Biden's hands on how to proceed. Yeah, I mean, Sarah, to that point, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, how exactly is the Democratic Party divided and how has it evolved on immigration in, I guess, recent decades even? So something we definitely heard a lot in the presidential primary debates was the 1994 crime bill, right? Well, at the same time in that era when Democrats moved to be really tough on crime, Clinton was the first time they'd won the presidency in three elections. And part of that was a shift to be tougher on law enforcement. You saw that with immigration, giving us a the immigration system we know today around deportations, making sure that the border was secure and restricted. Um, but now, as you mentioned, you know, ICE and abolishing it, um, not having open borders, but having a much more humanitarian view of immigration, where the federal government is not deporting as many people, where there are pathways to citizenship, and where the numbers of immigrants who are allowed into the country each year is, you know, boosted up. That's now a significant wing of the Democratic Party, while at the same time, you still do have a more centrist faction within the party that has its roots in the older labor wing of the party um, and the older just establishment wing that cares about the economy, the American worker. And so even though overall the party has shifted so that they are in favor of immigration, that hasn't really translated to policy aside from paving a way for um, what are called the dreamers, right? Those who were brought here as children um, illegally. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of truth to what Nate said about um you know, democratic positioning on immigration being defined in relation to Trump, who was so anti-immigration. But it's also worth noting that Democrats have, uh, Democratic voters at least, have become more liberal on immigration over time for decades, even before Trump. So for example, um, in 2004, only uh, less than 50% of Democrats uh, agreed with the idea that immigrants strengthen our country, um, whereas now that number is up beyond 75%. And then um, you also have Democrats seeing immigration as less of an economic threat than they have seen previously. So in 2004, again, 48% of Democrats said it was extremely or very likely that immigration would take jobs away from people, from Americans in the economy, um, whereas that number went down to 26% by 2016. It's also worth mentioning, you know, not everyone necessarily is delving into all, into all the details of particular policy positions or necessarily has that coherent a policy stance. It's maybe more of a, a feeling about kind of which party they trust more on immigration. Um, and on immigration, the polling is kind of more equivocal. Who do you trust more Democrats or Republicans to do on immigration? And actually, that kind of had traditionally been a GOP strong point. Under Trump, that shifted a bit more where in polls of plurality would say Democrats. Now it seems like it's more even handed again. But this is not like the Democrats' best issue on questions like that, right? If you ask voters, who do you trust more on health care? 
Democrats or Republicans, right? As many challenges Democrats had with passing Obamacare and so forth, people just trust Democrats more on that issue, right? On immigration, it's a, a lot more equivocal. Yeah, and to underscore that issue, even before there were reports of a surge at the border, immigration was something that Biden, it was one of his poorest issues that he was pulling on already. It just is something that I think is hard for Democrats to effectively message because there are so many intra-party divisions on how best to handle it. Yeah, I, I want to kind of put a finer point on that. Over the weekend, we saw a new polling out from ABC News and Ipsos, which showed that Biden is underwater um, for his handling of this, you know, the way they describe it as the situation with migrants at the border. So his approval there is net negative 16. Also saw Politico Morning Consult polling recently that showed that 43% of voters overall believe that undocumented immigrants who are currently living in the U.S. should have a pathway from citizenship down 14 points since January. I'm quoting Politico here. Among Democrats, support for a pathway dropped from 72% to 57% over that period, and just one in four Republicans backed the idea down 10 percentage points. So it seems like since Biden has taken office in particular, we have seen you know, you mentioned thermostatic public opinion. It's almost been, you know, just a matter of months that has caused uh, this backlash. Is this is this common? Should we maybe like question this polling, wait for more data? Um, you know, what's going on here? I would like to see more data on that. So so one thing that's worth noting is that 43% seems like a low number, but an additional 19% also said that um, undocumented immigrants should be able to stay in the country, just not become citizens. Um, so there is kind of a glass half empty, glass half full way to describe that for Democrats. Um, but yeah, the it's interesting because Morning Consult is usually a very stable pollster because of the way they do surveys and it's like a tracking poll. So like to see that kind of decline really surprised me. You'd see much smaller movement for them usually. Um, so I and and I do and typically there is generally a lot of support, uh, like in the past, even before Trump, um, you know, giving a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants has been popular. So um, I would like to see more data before fully running with that. I agree with that. Um, I don't think, you know, it is just one poll. And I don't think it overwrites the longer term trend here that we were talking about earlier, where, you know, since the mid 2000s, Democrats have been by and large, it's up you know, over 90% now to say that immigrants strengthen the country. And so, you know, I kind of read this as, you know, what Nate was saying up top about some of this is how the media is playing it, what the messaging looks like. Conservatives, Republicans have been doubling down on what's happening at the border, um, particularly and you know, more mainstream organizations have as well in the sense of wanting access to where the children are currently being sheltered. What are the conditions like? I think that poll reflects that Americans are not happy with how Biden is handling it versus maybe a real change on immigration views. Yeah, I, I was going to ask that negative, that net negative 16 approval from the ABC News poll of how Biden's handling the migrant crisis. How can we tell whether that's like more kind of left leaning voters in particular who would be concerned about you know, the humanitarian conditions, they should be letting more migrants in or that they should be in better facilities versus people who want to see Biden take a tougher stance on, you know, enforcement and kind of sealing the border uh, in a more Trump style way. Like, it, how, how can we tell where that negative opinion is coming from? Yeah, Galen, I think it's a combination of both, right? Anytime you see, frankly, you know, approval rating numbers go down below the normal kind of 50-50 range, it has to be, you know, both weakness with the base and opposition. So among Democrats in that poll, they approved of Biden's handling of the situation on the border 64% to 33%, which obviously is positive, but I think is a lot weaker than you would normally like to see among your base. So I think clearly there is some Democratic discontent. But then, of course, on the other hand, you had Republicans who said that they um, disapproved of it um, 10 percent to 89 percent. Um, so near unanimous opposition from Republicans. So it's it is that combination there. Although I, I would say I, I wonder if there are some Republicans who actually it's, uh, you know, we don't know what direction the Republican opposition comes from, too. And if the framing of Biden's uh, of the situation is that he is also keeping, quote unquote, kids in cages, 
maybe the kind of the out party dynamic is so strong that Republicans will start to see that as, oh, Biden's letting kids suffer. Complicated to sure. parse through the data here. Looking forward, you know, kind of on day one, Biden proposed this big immigration reform bill that would provide a pathway to citizenship for most immigrants in the country illegally. According to Politico reporting, after a whip count in the House, it did not seem like Democrats had the votes to pass that. They instead passed two separate bills, one focused on providing a pathway to citizenship for dreamers, people who came to this country as children, um, and then also a pathway to citizenship uh, for farm workers. You know, looking ahead, what is the Democratic position here on immigration um, with in terms of like a big reform bill? And are they likely to get anything passed um, over these, you know, two years at least that they have the House, the Senate and the White House? You know, Biden was one of the Democrats, right, in the debates who didn't come out and say, I think it should, you know, be we should decriminalize those who are crossing the border um, undocumented. Right. And the fact that he did that suggests that to some extent he's going to try to hone the middle of the line of the party as best as he can, right? In the sense of, I want to pave a path to citizenship, but in order to do that, I'm going to need 10 Republican votes unless I do away with the filibuster. And that will require some level of trade-offs around border security, right? And to be clear, it's not just, I mean, this is true more so in the House than the Senate, but it's not just Republicans who are pushing for like border security. A lot of Texas Democrats um, and people who just live along the border, including Hispanic voters who, as we saw in 2020, did shift to the right and vote for Trump, want more border security. So it is this complicated issue, too, of like those who live closest to the border. There's its own politics around it that isn't actually as straight, you know, Republican, Democratic as a lot of other issues and keeping that part of the party happy versus, you know, more vocal members like um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez asking for um, a more uh, open uh, immigration policy that doesn't cap as many migrants coming into the country. And so, right, <laughs> as Nate said, as with everything moving forward here, it's hard to see what the electoral math is, or it's hard to see what the um, congressional math is for Democrats to get this through, right? It, it would require, dare I say, bipartisanship. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be happening. Right. So, the to kind of set the scene a bit the as i understand it there are three bills under consideration there's biden's kind of moonshot immigration proposal pretty progressive would provide a path to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants that bill doesn't even seem to have the support right now at least to pass the house then there are two smaller bills that have passed the house one that would um, provide a path to citizenship for um, the DACA recipients as well as temporary protected status people and then uh, also one that would um, reform the system for farm workers and provide a path to citizenship for about one million undocumented farm workers those two i think are the question marks and you would think that maybe individually there would be some, some support, there would be at least some Republicans who would be in favor of that, considering that those are pretty popular things. Um, but I think what you might just be seeing is, you know, polarization strikes again, and this idea of a lack of forbearance, which is a fancy political science term for the parties don't trust each other, they don't want to work with each other, they don't want to hand the other party a legislative victory. And so like, there probably could be a just based on the polling, you know, both, for example, um, the Dream Act and increased border security are very popular with the American public, including among both parties. And so you would think that maybe a compromise bill that gave a path to citizenship for dreamers, um, but also beefed up border security could actually get 60 votes in the Senate. But I think because of this partisan distrust and polarization, um, that bill may just not get proposed. All right. Well, we'll continue to watch how this unfolds and we'll watch how the polling unfolds as well. Whether or not we do see a public opinion backlash to, you know, the Biden administration or whether or not those, you know, the polls that I mentioned earlier on were outliers. But that's it for now. So thank you, Sarah, Nate and Nathaniel. Thanks, Thanks Galen. Thank you. My name is Galen Druk. 
Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidegary Curtis is on audio editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.